Before we dig our teeth into the topic, and as I said, we will have three hours together to discuss. I hope it will be useful, uh, not necessarily to learn, but perhaps to open minds, to think, to reflect, because that is the best way, in my view, to prepare. So let's start. We live in a world of crisis. Crisis is everywhere. You open a newspaper in the morning, you will read five, six, seven articles that have the word crisis in the title or subtitle. Online, offline, everywhere, everything is a crisis today. The term is used, abused, and misused. The result is that not only we no longer have an understanding of what crisis is and means, we confuse it with issues, with emergencies, with events. But also, I think the net effect is that we become numb to the term. We don't feel the term anymore. Crisis is a very strong term. It's an emotional term. But this overexposure to crisis means that we no longer feel what a crisis really means and how a crisis really feels. We could spend the next three hours discussing what a crisis is. And with some of you, uh, we haven't really spent three hours, but we spent a good hour, hour and a half in our trainings to discuss everybody's view and points of view of what a crisis is. But sometimes the simple definitions capture the essence. And I had the pleasure of spending the past two days with Patrick, um, walking around Milan, but also talking and discussing understanding each other's points of view, and he gave me a, I think, fantastic definition of crisis, and I will just read it, because it's not mine. Crisis is the destruction of our points of reference. Hmm? Think about that for a second. Crisis is the destruction of our points of reference. We find ourselves in a universe we don't know how to navigate. That is what a crisis is, and we will explore, thanks to Patrick, this topic. One thing we can say, though, is that crisis is unpredictable. This is a fact. Crisis is unpredictable. Many times, when I meet with clients, they tell me, oh, we don't need crisis management. We have a fantastic risk management system. We have all our risks are anal analyzed, and we also have business continuity. And it's just, we don't need crisis management. We don't need crisis preparedness. The truth is that the events that we identify and plan for don't materialize, and that the events that materialize are those we did not expect. That is the reality. But despite the abuse of the term, the fact that we continuously hear about crisis, it's the Prime Minister, it's the Movimento Cinque Stelle, it's uh, this company, it's that company, it's an earthquake, it's a tsunami, whatever it is, the reality is that crises have become more frequent. Crises not only have become more frequent, they have become more intense. And not only have they become more intense, they span a longer period of time. So the question is, why is that? What has changed in the past decade to put us in this situation? Why are crises more frequent? Why are they more intense? Why do they span a longer period of time? So let me share with you a few thoughts. The first, naturally, I think we're all aware, is the cutthroat competition within the media industry to capture viewers, to capture readers, and to keep them glued to websites, to traditional media, or to TV. So in this environment, everything has become hyper. And this, of course, is further uh, emphasized by 24-hour news cycles, 24-hour TV channels, um, and so on. So the cutthroat competition for reader and viewers pushes traditional media to battle it out. And the way they battle it out is by making everything hyper. Everything is breaking news. Everything is updates of breaking news. But there is a new dimension, which some of you may have noticed, which is investigative journalism. In this cutthroat competition between media outlets, what we're seeing is media outlets creating special teams, 
And it's very interesting. You can go on the New York Times website uh, to look at their investigative team. Investigative team. Um, there is another website which is called Bellingcat, which you may have heard of recently. They analyzed the videos from Iran to try and understand what had happened to the airline uh, that was unfortunately uh, hit by, by uh, Iran uh, missiles. So, just to read you a little quote, the leader of the New York Times investigative team, broadly, an investigative story is discovering things that are not known, that have a real impact, and are questionable in some way, either legally, ethically, in terms of whether people are violating the public trust. So, in this competition, we now have a new dimension, which are journalists looking at video, looking at news, looking for stories, and if you want, the Me Too movement, for example, is a result uh, of such, such activities. But then, of course, there's not only traditional media, we have social media. Social media is an amplifier, is a polarizer, and also, of course, what social media does is it takes a local event and it gives it a global stage. This is something that did not exist 10 years ago. This is something that 15 years ago did not exist. We used to think local media, regional media, national media, international media. That distinction no longer exists. A local event, in the fraction of a second, goes on a global stage. Then again, there's other things to look at. Organizations, NGOs, citizen movements, think protests in Hong Kong, Think Gilets Jaunes, think Lebanon, are better organized and better prepared. They represent today a greater threat. Regulations. I don't need to tell the chemical industry, I don't need to tell friends from the aviation industry. Regulations are becoming more stringent. It is more and more difficult to meet the challenges of regulations. And of course, it's very easy not to follow the regulations, not because you want to, but simply because it is so complex, something may have slipped. And that, of course, immediately leads into investigations, leads into potential legal problems. And then again, more and more sophisticated analytical tools allow us to detect in food, in cosmetics, um, all sorts of subatomical particles, contaminants, that immediately create, create a problem. And then, the last few points, the rapid adoption of technology. We live with technology. We don't know what it means not to live with technology, and technology is a great thing, but of course technology can also go wrong. And with the evolution of technology comes artificial intelligence, the challenges of the future, but also, as Patrick Balletto mentioned, data privacy and security, data security. We, today, a good 50% of crises are cyber-related. Cyber warfare, cyber espionage, ransomware, malware, data breaches, you name it, it's in the list. And last but not least, I would say complexity. Complexity in the organizations, complexity in the companies, complexity in society. So all of this sets the stage for a different approach. Maybe not a different approach, but certainly challenges that 10, 15, 20 years ago we would not have faced. Crisis also today extend over a much longer period of time. We have the ability to dig into a company to see what it was doing five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to go look for the seeds of a potential crisis, where it was born from, corporate culture, events that the company had to meet and challenges in the past. So we have the ability to go all the way back in time, and at the same time, the moment you're caught up in legal proceedings, you're in the game, five, 10, 15 years, Think some of the Italian uh, crisis, companies who have, who have, and I will not mention for obvious reasons, but if you think once in a while, they come back, there's an investigation, there's 
uh, first degree, appeal, and final judgment. So all of this may already seem a big challenge, but in reality, that's not all, unfortunately, because we need to put this in the context of what's happening in Western societies. And this is really very, very important. There are two words that I would like to mention, and I will spend the next few minutes discussing each. The first is trust, fiducia, trust. The second is truth, verita. These two words are, in our context, extremely important. Let me, let me talk about trust for a second, and I have not prepared a presentation, but I do want to show you two slides, because every study that has been conducted, either internationally or in Italy, points to one very simple fact. We don't trust anybody or anything anymore. This is a very recent uh, research published by La Repubblica in December. I will not comment it. I will let you take a few seconds to look at the green column, which is quite important to look at. And then, of course, to look at the left, at the right, left for you, right for me, column with the different categories. And very few pluses, lots of minuses, and this is just over a decade. If we went back another decade, I think we would be completely baffled by what is happening. And if you just keep your eye for a second on the top line, the Forza dell'Ordine, then you may not be surprised to see this. So, just thought I'd uh, get a smile on your faces before, uh, before we continue. So, Trust, we don't trust as citizens, as managers, as probably politicians, anything or anyone. But then there's another problem, and it's the problem about truth. There's a very nice little book, if you have some time and you read English, by Michiko Kakutami, who's not some strange Japanese uh, researcher, but he's the editor of the New York Times Book Review, who wrote a book published two years ago called The Death of Truth. And it's a very interesting, it's about 100 pages, I invite you to read it. And what he says in this book, I will not summarize it for you, but just a few, again, thoughts. He argues that over the past 10 years, truth has been undermined in Western, society, Western societies by three fundamental factors. The first is the merging of news, politics, and information, entertainment. News, politics, entertainment. And if you think about our own TV channels, you can see that very vividly. You don't need to go to the US to see that. The second element is the toxic polarization of society, not in terms of ideology, but in terms of emotions. And this takes place on social media. The third is the growing populist contempt for experts and expertise. And this is something that touches some industries very closely. Barack Obama, the former US president, observed one of the biggest challenges we have to our democracy is the degree to which we do not share a common baseline of facts. People today are operating in completely different information universes. So, we live in a world of facts, and yet we also live in a world of alternative facts. So if you have facts and you have alternative facts, then you have truths and you have alternative truths. And this becomes extremely difficult to manage. So not only have we stopped trusting, but we live in a world of multiple subjective truths. I have a truth, you have a truth, 
Somebody else has a different truth. What's happening is we're no longer seeing events through the same lenses as we did in the past, but each of us or each group or subgroup looks at events through their own particular lens. And this, of course, becomes a huge challenge when we're looking at crisis management, at how people make meaning of events. People no longer make meaning of events the same way. And this is a real problem. So, to sum it up, this is the complexity that we're faced with when we are called to manage critical events. It is not as simple, perhaps, as it used to be in the past. So the question then is, how do we navigate this complexity? And here is the title of our meeting this morning. How do we navigate this very uncertain and unwelcoming sea? It's called crisis. So I hope today, and it's my conclusion, we'll be able to give you some food for thought, that you will leave this room looking at crisis perhaps in a slightly different way.